Okay, let's see. I'm just checking if Christy can see me. I know there's a lot of technical difficulties, Hi, everybody, so I'm just waiting a bit. Okay, good. So I'll just wait a couple of minutes um, to allow people time to come on. So my name is Denise Williams. I'm a speech and language therapist. And today I wanted to talk to you about understanding communication. So I'll just wait a little bit longer because I know sometimes it takes people a while. Christy was saying to sign on. So while we're waiting, I just want to say thank you to Christy for inviting me to join in this series, the talk series. I've been watching some of the videos um, and it's been really good. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for Belize. And I'm sure all of these speakers you're having will create such a good resource for you to use. Um, so I'm really glad and grateful to be a part of it. So thank you to Christy and thanks to Autism Belize for having me today. Just wait a little longer. I'll wait on a cue from Christy to know it's okay to start. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start. And obviously if you've joined at, joined at different times in the video, I know Christy puts it up so you can watch the video again um, and then drop any questions in. Christy knows how to reach me. Um, I can always answer questions after. So welcome again. So I'm Denise Williams, speech and language therapist. So this talk today is called Understanding Communication. And um, I purposely put understanding communication as opposed to understanding speech and language because really it's, it's more about the communication, right? So as speech and language therapist, just a little background, we assess and treat both children and adults actually. And we work with um, people who have communication, speech, language, um, swallowing, eating, or drinking difficulties. Um, most therapists end up specializing in adults or children. Um, I've done both, but right now, when for a few years, it's been specializing in children, specifically with special educational needs. So I just have a passion for that population. So understanding communication. So I thought it was really important for us to do this based on looking at the typical building blocks for communication. And I'm gonna show you a diagram so that you have a reference point to understand what I'm talking about. So the reason we talk about the building blocks for communication is that basically those are the things you need to be a good communicator, okay? But before we go into that, let's think about what is communication. So in the simplest term, I'm not gonna give you no long, boring textbook definition, but communication is basically just the exchange of information between people, right? Um, and it's a, so there's a sender, receiver, and in the middle there's a message. And so that's basically what communication is all about. And if we think about it, communication is really how we get access to a lot of experiences in our life. So, you know, it just makes, once you think of it as a whole package as communication, it makes you think how much our kiddos with autism actually don't have that much access. To things or people or experiences because of limited communication. All right. And when I'm talking about communication, I'm talking about your tone of voice, your gestures, body language, facial expressions, speech, um, anything that we use is just your overall body language, sign language, and just even physical closeness that you have to somebody. Because depending on how close you are to someone, you can communicate different things. Okay. So the big thing for us to understand is why we communicate. What's the reason that we communicate? 
And it's something that we do naturally and it came automatic for us. You know, nobody has to teach you to communicate. And so maybe sometimes we don't think about reason. But the reason we communicate, there are different reasons. And some of them are to express basic wants and needs, um, to be able to protest, which is very important in kids advocating for themselves. And it's actually, I think, one of the earliest um, reasons that they actually um, start to show, you know, whether whether the way they're doing it is appropriate or not. Um, the fact is quite early is that innate ability to protest if they don't like something, if they don't like a person, if they don't like the food you're giving them. So that's still a way, a why they communicate. Um, another one is questioning. So being able to question people, you know, being able to comment on things, clarify things. And if you think these are things we do every day for ourselves, we use a variety of reasons to communicate, you know, just on the job, you know, if you get an email from a boss or something and you want to question it, you know, you want to be able to comment and if you want to clarify a point. So you're doing a lot of these things automatically. And maybe that's why a lot of time as parents, we don't stop to think about all the things that are needed because it happens so automatic for us. So I'm going to work out this switch. You know what? I'm not even going to try and do the share page. First, um, Christy, I'm just going to show you. So I'm going to show you the diagram that I'm going to be referring to. Okay, so let's make sure you can see it. So it's the building blocks of communication. And I'll put all this up. Um, I have a handout with strategies that I can leave with Christy as well for people to access after. So basically looking at the building blocks for communication. When you're looking at this, I want you to think it's not so much about developmental or chronological age. So it's not so much that, okay, you do the first level by two years old. You do the, it's not that. I want you to look at it in terms of just things that are needed to help you be good communicators, right? So at the bottom, we have all the things like opportunity, reason, and motivation. Now this bottom layer is where a lot of people forget or they don't think about. Um, so we usually tend to start at the blue layer. Let me go back. So this blue layer where people usually start talking about communication and speech and language is where you have the turn taking, eye contact, um, all those pre-verbal skills. So I know there was, you had a presentation on the Autism Talk series, a really nice one. Um, I think it was from an early intervention specialist or a teacher, and she spent a lot of time talking through all those pre-verbal skills, um, like eye contact and listening and turn-taking. So what I want to understand with the pyramid is that, remember, I'm not talking about developmental age, it's just skills that we need to be able to be good communicators, right? And I wanted to base or talk today off that because it's so important for us to understand all the layers that are involved for our kids to be good communicators and not just to say, oh, because you have autism of a uh, diagnosis of autism, sorry. It means, yes, you're going to have communication issues, but it's not as it means you're going to be just not able to communicate, right? So if we can understand the different levels involved in the pyramid, it would help us to understand how to help our kids and how to help them to access and be better communicators. So let's go back to the pyramid. So the next section, that purple, the dark purple section is where most people think um, communication starts, which is talking about understanding spoken language. And that's really in terms of the child being able to understand words, phrases, and sentences. Another level is expressive language skills. So that's how the child can express themselves, whether it's by words, pictures, phrases, or speech, and then at the very top, that's where you have understanding and being able to use accurate speech sounds. So those actual speech skills are kind of a fine tuning skill. It's the, la the last skill that they need in terms of articulation and clear sound production. So I wanna spend some time talking about the bottom of the pyramid. And you know, this means it's the foundation. So opportunity, reason and motivation. That's the foundation for any communication, for any good communicator. What do I mean by that? Meaning if you don't have an opportunity to communicate, you're not gonna be able to use the skills you have or even to improve on them. So, you know, it's like you're going for, you, you know you want to get a promotion, 
but nobody's taking you on. There's not the opportunity to go and do it. And you'll never be able to go and show that you have those skills or go and be able to develop in your profession if the opportunity isn't created. So this is a big one for us to understand for our kids. And I think when we realize a lot of children with special needs, if you think about it and studies have shown that as they're developing, they're actually spoken to less than typical developing children. Um, and so the thing is, they're not even getting stimulated with as much language as you would do with a child who didn't have special needs. And there are, you know, there are many reasons for that. But I know even in a classroom setting, you see it a lot. You know, the kid who's quiet or won't say much or is nonverbal, which means they're quiet, that child is usually not getting as much in terms of talking to them, giving them stimulation. And what they found is even when they did studies at home, they found that people who had families who have special needs children at home, those children hear less language around them. So nobody's speaking to them or engaging them as much as if they didn't have a special need. So it's just something to be mindful of. It's not anything to feel guilty about. It's just something to have in the back of your head. And then once you're aware of it, then you can make an extra effort to change or to improve that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit in terms of the actual, so we did opportunity, you have to create opportunity. The thing is the reason. So these kids have to have a reason to communicate. We talked before about having to be able to protest something, to be able to request. And that's one that people are familiar with because most people um, start to work with kids in terms of working on their requesting skills. Okay. And part of that goes on to the other part, the bottom part of the pyramid, which was motivation. So kids need to be motivated and have an interest to even want to communicate. So that's why people tend to start working in terms of being able to protest and being able to request wants and needs. Because if you want something and it's something you really want, then you're motivated. And so with that motivation, they can build the communication, okay? And for a lot of our kids, um, there are different, different needs and different levels. But for a lot of kids, sometimes you have to start, if they don't have much, much exposure, much, much interest, you have to start where the basic interests are. And for a lot of kids, it might be a favorite toy. For a lot of children, it's food, because then food is a basic need and it's something that they can control. And the thing is, there's not much that children with autism are able to control, but they can control what they eat. They can, the little bit that they can control, then that's what they're motivated by. So a lot of the beginning of engaging children, working on communication has um, kind of starts with food. It starts with reinforcers. If you know there's a favorite toy that a kid likes, then it's about presenting that each time. And once you've found what a motivator is, then that will help to give them a reason to communicate. Now, after you've given them the reason and know what motivation is, now you have to create opportunities. And this is where it comes in to play at home. So what I wanna talk about, I'm gonna go through the strategies um, just to give you some actual examples in terms of how we do in therapy, what we would work on. I wanted to spend some time talking about strategies. So I kind of broke up strategies to reflect the pyramid just to help. So the first part of the strategy, if you were talking about um, that level of motivation and opportunity, the strategy you could create at home is to give more opportunities. So we do this by actually setting up the environment. A big thing to do is to try and have some routine. I know we're probably tired of hearing people saying a routine, especially now with you know us being at home with COVID-19 and everything going on. The routines are so important because they've changed. And we almost have to spend time to just establish some routines. And here's the thing about routines. I want to say first, um, there's not a set routine that is standard throughout. The routine must fit your family and it must fit your lifestyle and your child's needs, okay? So everybody's routine looks slightly different and that's okay because your routine has to work for you and your family. The other thing about routine is that you, you can chunk it. So that most people have a morning routine. Like if we think I have a morning routine, 
basically I wake up, I do this, I make my bed, I do different things. I get a cup of tea, I feed the cats, you know, and then you go on and there's an afternoon routine and there's there's a going home routine. So you, you don't have to have this big, massive schedule. But if you have ideas of little routines that you're doing, some of you might have might think you don't have any routine because it's not what you typically think is recommended. But it's just something that happens repetitively. And if there's some sequence and order to what you do in your home, that's your routine. OK, and the thing with routines is that it helps the child to know what to expect. So routines are predictable. And if we think of how routines help us, it's like we can do some. I can do my morning routine half a week sometimes, you know, and that's the thing because it's predictable. I know what's going to happen. I know what to expect. And for a lot of our kids with autism, this world is not very predictable for them. And they're in constant like a fight or flight um, experience because they don't know how they'll react to something, what will be taken away, what they'll enjoy. There's a lot of uncertainties for them. So what we want to do is create some predictability. With that predictability, it also helps because then if this every if you're doing the same thing for a morning routine, then it's going to the bathroom, brushing your teeth and having a shower. What I like from a speech and language point of view as well with routines is that because you're doing the same thing, you're also exposing the child to the same vocabulary. So if every morning we brush our teeth, we have a shower, brush our hair, it's the same vocabulary I'm going to be exposing you to. We're going to be talking about brush hair, brush teeth, get the toothbrush, get you this. So it helps you to narrow, to really give a lot of opportunity to practice that same vocabulary. So that's a good thing with routines. Um, predictable language, it helps with sequencing. It helps them to understand what's first, what's next. And that's an important skill for them to develop in as a life skill, but also in terms of their language development. It increases the opportunity for you to do it. It also reduces their anxiety. Um, routines help them to reduce anxiety, which can help, sorry, with their self-regulation. And it increases communication um, interactions. One other strategy you can do at home in terms of routines is that you can actually sabotage the environment. So you might hear us people recommend this to you. And the reason, don't sabotage in the beginning when you're just establishing a routine though. This is after the child is very much aware of the routine and has it doing it well um, and mastered the routine. This is when we could sabotage the environment. So this is a strategy um, people tend to use. And that's why while you're carrying out daily activities then you purposely forget an object that's always there. So even if you were, you gave them the bowl of cereal um, it was time for them and they love cereal, then maybe you'd leave the spoon, you know? Um, and then that just creates an opportunity in a routine where you would always say to them, oh, here's your spoon, here's the bowl, and they know time to eat, then this would be an opportunity you could create now for them to communicate or have a need, a reason to communicate with you and request the spoon. And you just hope they don't just take the bowl and drink it and not bother to request. But you know what I mean? It actually helps um, if you sabotage things in a familiar routine to a child. OK, the other on the other part of the pyramid where we're talking about what the early intervention person you had on spoke to you guys about with words like the eye contact and play skills, all those pre-verbal language skills. One of the strategies um, that they tend to, she spoke a lot about nice strategies. So please go back and watch that video because it was really useful. And I thought, oh, well, that took a big chunk onto mine, so that's fine. But the other thing you can think of is that interactions, we have to make interactions meaningful. And a good way to do that, um, I learned quite early on in the beginning, I used to always try to do like a speech therapy activity. And if it wasn't something functional that made sense to the child, then it wasn't meaningful and they would opt out, you know? So we have to think about what we choose for the interaction, something meaningful. So if it is that a child likes um, Play-Doh or they like to actually do their um, potato head or whatever the activity is, then that's the activity we have to use to create the opportunity for communication. And a, a lot of kids, if they can't see the sense to the activity or the purpose of it, they're not going to just engage in it. It has to be either fun, it has to be giving them a reward, they have to get something from it. So if we think of what things the kids like and then use that to help with communication. The other thing is playing games that have 
like you need a part so like piece by piece so you know like playing games that you have lots of pieces to like even a potato head so you know at potato head you have all the parts and bits that even after they put in one and most kids like pushing in and pulling out so even if they put one piece in then it's a good way for you to hold the other piece back so again we're creating that opportunity and a reason for them to communicate okay and I would always say, depending on the child, I would always start by giving them a couple pieces so they get the, you know, the reward of playing. And then I would hold back maybe three. So it depends on your child's attention, depends on their level of frustration. Then I would say, okay, I'll try for three times to get them to request. And depending on the level of request looks different. It might just be that I just want them to look at me. Just looking in my direction, if they've, if, if they've never done that before, then this is where I would say, oh, nice looking and then give them the object right if it is that they're starting to point then maybe you want them to point if it is that they're using pecs or pictures or something else whatever the method is to communicate what i want to say is that we want to create the opportunity for it okay so that's what we're talking about now on the other part we had about language understanding language um some things we need to talk about is a good strategy to remember is something called a plus one rule. <clears throat> Sorry. So the plus one rule is basically if your child is at the understanding level, so then they're understanding one word level, then when you're speaking to them, so if they know this is cup and they're able to communicate cup, whether it's point to cup, reach for the cup, look at you, um, for the cup speak or use whatever communication methods they're using, if it's an iPad, if it's a PEX, and I'll go through these um, in a bit, then this is where if they're using one word, when you're giving them, then you're going to model two word. So you just plus one on. So if they're using a one word level understanding, then you add two. So if they requested cup, then I would be like, oh yes, my cup, white cup, big cup, you know, um, anything like that, you're adding a word to the one they already have. It's the same thing if they were, you say, okay, put if they're at the two word level, so they can put two words together, like Christy shared that um, Mateo put two words together where he could, you know, said the other day, you know, mama show up. So that would be a nice way if your child's consistently doing two words, then now you're going to remember it's called plus one. So you add one more and you say, you know, mom, sh mom shower now. So you would just add another word on for the child. And it's just a, each, it's just a nice way to not keep them at a level, but help them to expand, all right? Another thing that we want to pay attention to is reducing questions. So the thing is a lot of times we tend to ask kids questions. So we might say, you're not eating that? You're gonna eat? Do you want this? And before they even process the first question, we've asked another one. So it's just something to be mindful of, um, reducing the questions, especially if your child is not using a method of communication or not having a lot of language. Um, you want to reduce questions and instead try commenting. So being able to, instead of saying, oh, do you want the, do you want drink? If the child didn't respond, you're not getting a processing thing and stop asking, then just say drink. Oh, look, juice, milk pour a drink, more drink, and use a comment instead of just asking a question and then knowing the child that doesn't have a way to answer you, okay? Another thing we can look at is to move in, it's related to that one, but it's almost like being like, you know, like a sports comment is always talking through what's happening. So it's like you are going to comment on actions and narrating, so still using routines, so remember, you're still using your home routines. You haven't bought any equipment and crazy toys yet. This is all the strategies that you can just start using at home. And so what you want to do is as you're doing something, you're going to be your own sports commentator. So you comment on what you're doing. You know, so if you're doing whatever, you're like, okay, we're getting dressed, let's put the shirt, hands in. And some of it you do automatically as parents. Parents sometimes do that automatically. Um, but just to remind you that it's a good skill and it's something that encourages because you're associating language with an action or something that a child is doing. So even sometimes, you know, you'd have kids who want to play up on their own. And sometimes what I would do in terms of participating, if they just like to in the car by themselves, then my way to start working on communication is to deal with having that shared interaction. 
right? So I might go over to the child and then try, you know, just talking about what they're doing. So even if they're pushing the car and half time they're not paying me any mind because they're just playing with the car. But then this is my opportunity now to make some noise. And then I might go and make a noise when the car hits something. And a lot of times when I'm working with children, I find maybe I have to do that a few times. Maybe I have to get my own car and purposely crash into their car. But if I just keep the language the same, consistent, so every time they hit, and you'll find they keep doing it over and over because they want to hear me making that crash sound. And they haven't started looking at me yet, but at least we're getting that. And then maybe by the next session when I'm working with them, then all of a sudden I'm still doing the same thing. And then they just start looking at me or there's no anticipation of me making the sound. And then there's some shared attention. Okay, so a lot of times parents would say, oh, yes, um, they like playing, they play together. But one thing I want us to remember is there's a difference with your child liking to just play on their own or being able to join in with someone. And so that example with a car is a nice way that you could join in the play activity with them. Okay, the other one is giving physical choices. So to help with communication skills, and you've probably heard this, is that you would show two choices. So you show them two things and you say, you want to drink, drink, and then you get to show them two to see if they can point or even to reach towards one. So try giving more choices and physical choices for the child. If your child uses a picture system to communicate, then obviously use the two pictures to give them the choice. So that would be, I don't know. For example, if they use pictures, I'll just do the NAC part, but if they use pictures, then it might be that you show them both things and then ask you about apple or orange. So offering choices is a nice way to encourage communication. And the other thing is to use total communication. So I mean, what I mean by that is things like making sure you use enough variety. So a lot of times when I'm working with kids and I'll say, do you want more? I automatically sign and then I'll even touch a picture. So just, you know, I don't know if it's some children you sign, they respond, a lot of children respond really well to gestures and signs. So the thing is, however you get your message across, try and do it in a variety of ways. Use a picture or use the real object. You know, say the word, whether or not they're speaking, you say the word, give choices, and then be able, be able to do a sign with it. So at least you're giving them lots of options and stimulation to reinforce the language that you're using. The other thing is when you're teaching a new word or a new concept, which I'm going to go into when I'm talking about AAC, is that we want to start with our kids with giving the most prompts in the beginning um, and then slowly fade the prompts as the child gets better. So a lot of times we spend time doing what I call testing. Like we end up asking a lot of questions and going, touch this, touch this. All right, say, say apple, say apple, say it, say it. You know, and it's like this testing mode that we're in. Um, and I know it's our anxiety and anticipation to want the child to perform, um, but it actually isn't that helpful. What children really need, the best thing you could do is do a lot of modeling. And I always say to parents, model. And if you think you've modeled enough, model again. Modeling, modeling, modeling. Model what you want them to do, showing them what you want them to do. And then start with prompting, if, it, if, if it's even hand over hand, so if I have to physically take your hand in the beginning and start doing something, and then eventually I can push back my hand and just push your hand towards it, I can probably just tap your hand and you'll get hints and then eventually you fade that prompt. But if it's a new skill or you want to teach them a new routine or a new activity, then you want to start with the most help first, giving them the most help, which would be a physical help. Um, and then also modeling, showing it and talking through it. Okay, so now I wanted to, I don't know if there are any questions. I'm supposed to be looking somewhere for questions on the side. I don't know, I don't see any. Christy, do you know if there are any questions for me to stop and answer before moving on to AAC? So while Christy tells me if there are questions, let's see, oh, over here, okay. I saw the point. No questions yet. Okay. So obviously pop questions in if you um, have anything you want me to talk about um, or to answer, because I want you to get the most from this um, talk as possible. The other thing I wanted to talk about is 
using AAC or what we call augmentative alternative communication. So it's basically using any other means for the child to communicate if they're nonverbal or they have some speech, but it's very limited. So this is a way that, and you probably are more familiar with the obvious things like PECs, um, which would be, I just had to see what I have at home. So this would be like a PECs book, or you can make a homemade PECs book with a photo album, there are different versions. Um, so that would be one. And the PECs book, you know, it has the pictures in um, and what we do and what PEX has started to do. PEX has a new course now where, you know, PEX used to have mostly the um, nouns or objects. Now they've started to include core words, what we call core words. So those are all these words like help. Let me turn that way. Me and this camera is first I'm going live, eh? So like all, so help, all done, um, stop, stop, see. So these are called core words. And what core words basically are is they, all the research has found that basically are these set of words, they're more function words that they find actually makes up 80% of what we see. So even if I didn't call an object or a noun and I was able to say, oh, I don't like it you would know I didn't like something. I didn't say what it was. So I didn't have to say, I don't like burger. But if I say, I don't like it, then that car is, you could understand it conveys meaning. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about core words. It's the base for what we're doing now with um, communication. So you have PECs, a lot of people use PECs and PECs has started to combine core words with their um, regular object pictures. The other thing is, um, which I spend a lot of time working with families on is Prolifo to go. And that's an app. They have different apps. They have touch chat, they have chatable. They have lots of different apps available now online. Um, and I'll just show you this one that I'm talking about. So this one, try and work this camera. So this one is one of the apps that are available. They're, most of them are set up very similar. Um, where they use words and it's on the screen and you touch to speak or communicate. This one is has everything on it, but you can actually get it as reduced as you want. So you can make the screen bigger or smaller. You can choose less or more um, words and vocabulary. So I'll show you an example that I have here. So this is the top one has fewer words selected. And that's just because those are the words the child has learned so far. And then the bottom one has more because then that child has more vocabulary, has learned and uses more words so that they'll get a board with more pictures on it. And even the top one, we could make it less. Some of my kids just have four pictures um, depending on what their vocabulary level is. But even with a four picture board, which maybe can be something like more, all done, want, and stop. Just those four words, we can use them in lots of situations. So if they, you could use more for mealtimes, if they want more of something, if they want more of a toy while it's playtime, you could use that word more. Um, if you want them to do more of the activity you've given them. So it's words that can be used across different activities and they're actually quite functional. Okay, I saw here where um, Christy posted, Matteo still uses a sign for more. Okay, <laughs> that he, he learned years ago. Yeah, lots of kids still rely on their signs even though they've developed some language or even use a communication system because it's just so natural. Think of how often a lot of us just gesture naturally, you know? So it's it's quite a good skill to start with. And just to clear up some myths, I know a lot of parents, when I started now, a lot of parents would say, oh no, I don't want you to design language because then my child won't speak. No, 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 I don't want them to do that. And then you want to say, okay, well, you know, if we have pictures for communication, no, I don't want him to use pictures, I want him to talk. Um, so this is something I want to talk about a little bit. So the thing is, 
whatever goals you have for your child for verbal lack verbal speech anything at all that's perfectly fine that's your goal but i want us to leave today just understanding a little bit more about communication as a whole and that as long as they get their message across that that's more useful than not doing anything while you wait for speech you know so i've always said to people to parents the worst thing you could do is to not do anything. And so the thing is, a lot of times, sometimes it's this dancing game between the therapist and the parent, because then you want to meet the parent's needs. But you know this child has skills and is able to learn to communicate, right? And then, so the thing is that you're like, well, well let's start working on pictures. Let's start working on something else until we get speech. And I might say that to a parent, even if I don't know if the child will be talking, but it's a nice, it's it's almost a way to help them to understand that we need to look at communication as a whole. So I have another question here. It says, what if the child is not interested in using pecs? Okay, so for that question, what I would say is, what is it about the pecs or the way that we're doing pecs that the child is not interested in using it? So remember what we said before in terms of having opportunity and motivation. So I would say to maybe we need to go to start in terms of pictures, but using it for motivation, motivational activity, using it for something they really want. And even if you do that, like match it to activity they want, which I'm assuming if you tried pets, you've probably tried to do it with a high preferred item. So the thing is to also be flexible to choose different things for the child. Um, so if they don't, if they're not interested in, you see, I want to ask more questions about that to see what's the um, underlying thing for the lack of interest in PECs. Um, even if you're not doing formal PECs where you need a third person to teach them, um, just using pictures, I would say, does the child even comprehend pictures? So um, the person who asked, I don't know if you can message me back and let me know, does the child have interest in pictures or seem to understand pictures anyway? So I don't know how to see if she responds. The thing is you can always use other things, maybe explore science, maybe explore using a communication device in terms of an app, if you do have access to one. Um, their protocol to go is, now they were on sale because of this whole COVID thing. So that's usually like on sale would be 150 US, but they're cheaper ones as well. Um, and there's also, the PEX, PEX has also a voice output because some children like having the voice immediate feedback when they do press something. So that's something to explore. Um, so basically to answer your question, if the child's not interested in PEX, then you would use other options. Try sign language, try using um, a voice output device. Okay, she, she answered, thank you. So she said he has no interest in pictures. So if he's not interested in pictures um, as yet, then maybe what you could do is work more on objects. So this is where I use something called um, object of reference. So we could see if the child actually understand the objects. Maybe they're not on that level to understand pictures because pictures are a little bit more abstract. So maybe they're more for concrete things like a picture. So even we do a lot of visual schedules um, where we tell them what time it is for things. So if it's time to go to the bathroom, then you might have a toilet roll. If it's time for lunch, you might stick a spoon um, for them to know that it's time for lunch. So that's another option to use the objects if they're not ready for pictures as yet. And then another question, also how can you improve a child's receptive communication skills? So working on their understanding in terms of what they understand. And I think that's quite why. So a good way to start is where we were saying on that pyramid before, where we had, where we're talking about working on all the foundational skills because sometimes we find we're getting a block let me go back to this sometimes we find we're getting a block higher up if we're starting to work on understanding spoken language we need to go back to the other levels to make sure the foundation is there okay because sometimes if the foundation is not there it's like you're building a house if the foundation is not good then you're going to have challenges going further up so if, if they're not understanding, then what I would do is go back to routines and work on sequence of routines. So that's what I would do. I would always link 
um, to work on their understanding. So if it was that the routine is when they come, they like to take out their bowl, help themselves to something, whatever it is during that routine, then I would be doing a lot of just one word level associating the word with the object. So then I would be saying cup, spoon, mix, mix, mix. And you do all the animated sounds, all those things in that pre-language area where you're going to be doing a lot more in terms of changing the tone of your voice, hand over hand, prompting, modeling things to them, and then associating the one word to it. So I would go back to work on routines or play games that they really like, stick to a game that they really like, and then comment on the things as you're doing it. And then that will approve the association of what they're hearing, this word, and what the item is, or what the action is that I'm doing. Something as simple as um, my godson, when I worked with him before, he, the, the real way we started to work on his communication before we even got any understanding or speech, he loved the five little monkeys. And, you know, he wasn't two years old. This is a seven year old, but he loved that song so much. And we spent so much time just jumping for him, jumping on the bed and me singing. And what made the connection was the communication, what worked on the communication, sorry, was the connection that we made. So I would always say, spend time on that foundation, trying to make a connection. He was there, not engaging, no eye contact, not interested in much. Um, and he would just love jumping on the bed, just jumping on the bed. And so I thought, okay, how am I going to make a connection? And then I would just stay there and just seeing five little monkeys jumping on the bed. And I knew he was enjoying himself, but he wouldn't look at me. And we did this for a couple of days. Um, and then every time I got to the point of the song, because I'm saying this because songs are a good way when it's a song that they like, children respond well to music. And so when I got to the part where it was like, and one fell off, then he started to fall and stop jumping. And that's the first time I knew, ah, you understand language. Because all along he would just jump as this, you know, everybody just thought it's this repetitive thing that he does. He just go in everybody in the house and jump, jump, jump. And then I started to engage him during the jumping. And I mean, it took me a couple of days. But then when I realized, when I said, oh, one fell down and bumped his head, and then he dropped, stayed still on the bed. And then when I started again, he started jumping again. So I would say that's a way to know that they're rich understanding language, if it's even that they're anticipating the next thing. And then from there, you could expand to, uh, to probably stopping the song seeing if they look at you, see if you get eye, eye contact, that anticipation that we're talking about, and then engage again. So when he started now looking at me, because I stopped singing, he didn't look at me in my eyes, which is fine. That's not, that's not a thing that a lot of our kids do, but he looked in my direction. And so when he looked at me, that's when I said, oh, more. And then I just made it, I wasn't expecting him to sign more. I was just modeling a word. And then I sang again and he jumped again. And we did this a few times because it takes a lot of repetition for a lot of our kids on the spectrum before they are able to master a skill. And you might get bored before them. Because, but it's sometimes I think, you know, parents feel, no, you, you sure I just have to keep doing the same thing. That's, I think it's boring or what? No, keep its consistency. The consistency is what really helps. And then over time, we, I kept doing that with him. And then when I said oh, more, and then he over time, then he couldn't do the full um, sign for more, but then he would do this. And I said, oh, you want more? And then we played the song again. So now we could develop from there. Now I knew he understood more and then I could develop some more vocabulary. And then from there we moved on and then I could introduce a picture to match with more. So I think it's always worth, if you finally get a block with pets or whatever it is, or there's a block with something, go back a step, look back at that foundation. Are you creating opportunity? Are you using the routine that you have? is are you using something that's motivating for the child? And then work on the preferred item, the, the things that the child likes, and use that to help you um, develop communication skills. I don't know if that helps with the receptive communication skills, but that's a nice way, using music, using the kind of anticipatory things, using repetitive stories that the child likes. But always, I always say to parents, it's worth, you know, when you go to all these assessments and doctors and therapists, they always ask you to write a list of things your child likes. What's your preferred, child's preferred items? What do, what's their go-to toys? And it seems exhausting that you always have to say this, but there's a reason for it. 
because we need to create opportunities and we can only do that if we know what motivates the child. So I would always say go back to the motivators, go back to the preferred activities and use that to start in terms of your routine and then attach language to it, hold off on something the child knows, see if he gets a response. Giving choice is a good way to work um, on developing receptive skills where you put two items up and then you say cup and then you'll make sure the child's choosing the right thing. And then you can increase that to three items and to see if they can discriminate. So these are all ways that you can help to work on um, improving their understanding and receptive skills. Okay, we have another question. Is there an age that a child reaches when you know that words will never come? No, is the straight answer for that. No, there's no special age that we reach to where we just think words will never come. And when you say words will never come, I'm assuming you mean in terms of speech. I'm assuming that's what you mean. And I want to say in terms of maybe this is a good question to ask because it's it's linked to that whole idea of developmental norms. Um, and developmental norms, they're a fact. But what I want to say with our population that we're working with, a lot of times I have found over the years, it's more their development of communication and language skills of a whole lot, on a whole, not just speech, has a lot to do with a mixture of their interest their experiences and their awareness of things around them. So I find a lot of kids when they start young, when they're diagnosed young, the things that you're seeing are things like, you know, not making eye contact, playing on their own, being in their own world, um, not engaging. So if you think if you're not engaging and you're not um, interacting with people, then you're not learning much vocabulary. They, a lot of our kids, because they start out like that at a young age, they miss all those social skills so you know when babies are naturally developing and you're looking and there and the baby will see and they see your facial expression and they'll be able to see your body language and that's why you get all these toddlers that you know they're so animated and they're giving you all these expressions nobody sat with them and said oh if you're really surprised do this it's things that they've picked up naturally from having eye contact with mommy or daddy from looking at your face and hearing you and then watching your eyebrows move and watching all these things. And then they're, they naturally do it as development. Most of our kids on the spectrum, because they haven't had that um, engagement opportunity because of lack of eye contact, because of whatever challenges they have as they were younger and developing, they didn't get that natural way of learning all these nonverbal skills like facial expression, body language, tone of voice. They didn't have that opportunity. And so that's where the gap is. And that's why even for a lot of our kids, even if when they do start to communicate, whether it's pictures or words or gestures, they still lack a lot of social skills. Um, and that's what you find a lot of parents are saying, well, he's doing this now, but when I take him out, he'll just pull his pants down out in whatever, or you know what I mean? Or just start doing something that's socially inappropriate for that setting. And it's because they missed those so that social development, the nonverbal skills so early. But there is no set age where you can say words would never come. And the mere fact you've asked that, I'm thinking you're still having as your goal to measure success by words. Um, and this is another thing I've had to talk to parents about. We have to think about how we're measuring success for a child um, and for us, because a lot of it is probably personal in terms of what would, what would success mean for me, for my child? Um, and is it for him to talk because that would just be easy and that's what I think is normal and that's what I want him to do. So it's almost like you have to gauge your level of measuring success. So if success is for your child to communicate, you want to know if your child needs something, you want to know if he feels angry, you want him to be able to manage his emotions, you want him to be able to be as independent as he can with his daily routine so you don't have to be behind him. Then those are all measures of success. Um, and if we're holding speech in terms of spoken word as our ultimate measure of success, then we'll miss every other development and milestone and every other achievement the child has made. So I really want us to look at communication as a whole, as in being an effective communicator is getting your message across, okay? Can the child get a message across? Um, and if we think of it, most of our kids can. 
you know, you're with your kids, you know that when they're annoyed, you know, they're different um, body language for different things, or they might use the same expression for several things, but you can know it, it gives you different messages. It's like, you know, you have some people with babies, they'll know, oh, this cry means they're hungry. This, this cry means the pamper needs changing, this cry. So I think automatically we're innately able to pick up on communication skills. And I just don't want us to spend any more time losing communication opportunities if we just spend time looking at speech as the only marker of success. Um, and I know it's difficult and we don't have to agree on that, that's fine. But it's actually, this is where the age thing comes in because you spend many years as the only marker for success being speech. And then we've reached 10, 11, 12, and they're not talking. And then you'll burn out because most people, especially um, children, there is a burnout level. You get highs and lows, you have peaks. Sometimes you have the energy to fight and advocate and push and another time in the child's life, you just need to chill for a bit, regain your energy and go again. And that's natural. And there's no guilt in that. But this is how we could get to a certain age where we have no method of communication because the only thing we were waiting on is speech. Um, and we could have developed so many other skills. There's a YouTube link for this girl called Carly. Um, and her parents had where eventually, I think she was 14, they, um, she has autism. She's on YouTube, very popular. She's done some interviews too. Um, and she actually, I think they got her, her speech therapist, she, they changed therapist and she finally got a speech therapist who was giving her, he realized she could type. So she wasn't into pictures much, she wasn't even, but he realized she could type, she could read. And so he started working on her, somebody says, love Carly, I know, I use it for all my video training <laughs> with parents, it's just really good. Um, and she basically could show that she had all this vocabulary and language inside. Now, if you saw her, you would not think there was all that going on inside, you know, because she still bangs her head, she still has movements, she still has some repetitive things. There's a lot of sensory issues still going on, and that's what you would see. But and that's the thing I always find. But anyway, she could type. She could type so much. She just put right sentences. I think she's working on a book. I think she has a blog. She has a blog um, that you can look at. And you know, it was her father. The one thing he said is he had no idea that she had all of this language inside. Um, and so that's the point I want to make. We need to start looking at communication wider so that we're giving our children an opportunity um, and a reason to communicate. Because otherwise, a lot of, a lot of kids that work, they'll just happily sit there and just go along with their life if you are not going to expect anything of them or give them opportunity to demand anything. They're just chilled, you know? And it's like until they realize that you're expecting more of them and you're engaging them and you're giving them opportunities and you're modeling and commenting and expecting and giving them a way to communicate. And I think the, the trick is to spend the time to find what it is. So um, let me see, Christy put here um, Carly's voice and they, they didn't discover, yeah, they didn't discover that she had this um, voice or could communicate until she was a teenager. So that's why I was bringing up that example to go back to um, the person who asked if there is an age to not expect to stop expecting speech. Um, and that's the thing. I don't think there is an age limit on developing or discovering your child's potential or communication skills. It's about creating the opportunity and giving them a method. Because if they don't have a method to communicate, that's highly frustrating. And, you know, I speak to, I work closely with a lot of ABA people, um, professionals, and this is the big thing, you know, you always see the behaviors and everybody wants to treat the behaviors and talk about the behaviors, but half of the behaviors are from communication issues. And sometimes if we can, and I'm not going into communication and behavior because that's a whole other talk, but if, if we actually spend the time, you know, when they're asking you about behaviors, they're always asking you, oh, what happened before? What was the antecedent? You know, and they want you to say, what happened when the behavior happened? What were you doing? What was the child doing? What did the child want? That's all because they're trying to break down was their communication opportunity? Was the child trying to communicate something? 
So I, I have found if when kids have a way to communicate, even some of the kids I'm working with, once they, once they started using, um, and I'm going to say the app in terms of expenses, there's also, you can always have a communication board, like paper-based. And a lot of my kids start with the paper-based one, um, especially if money's an issue. And so we do a lot of modeling. I might start with a smaller board, um, if I'm starting with a child and we're going to meal times, then it might just be a small board like this. And every time they're eating, I might hold packets of crisps, crisps or chips, and then I'm just keep going. Oh, more! Sorry, I'm trying to work this camera. More, and every time they uh, they look at me for the bag of chips, then that's when I touch more, and then give it to them. And I I start out like that, not expecting them to do it. It's the same thing as I expect so much to say, tell me more, tell me more. Worst thing ever. Um, because even if they tell you more out of frustration, I just go, ah, and then they're like, oh, he said more. No, he's frustrated and he wants you to stop. You know, it, it, so I would always say it's best to model. Um, and then after a while, I find the children just automatically themselves start pointing. So they'll just, even if they're doing the general direction, they'll get the idea that I'm to point to something to get something. And then I might move on to, okay, now let's do moving on. Let's do it now with you find a picture or let's do it with a sign. Whatever it is, it's just to give an opportunity. And Chrissy's sharing the name of her YouTube stuff is Carly's Voice. Yes. I definitely, definitely recommend watching it. Um, and her blog is quite interesting as well. So I'd, I'd, before I move on, any more questions? I'm aware of the time, Christy. Is there anything else? I would like to say as well, if because I know maybe not many people have questions to ask now, but if you think of something that you want to know, you can always post the questions and then Christy will show them to me and I can just answer them. And I'll share the resource in terms of strategies um, to leave with you. So the main takeaway I want you to have um, is if you're going to start to work, just to start to work on something at home, I would say even from this evening or tomorrow, you can decide um, on what would be the most meaningful word. And if it's just one word, I always say to parents, choose something in your environment. Choose whatever is going to be easiest for you as an adult to reinforce because you're the one who has to maintain it. Remember, they need lots of repetition, they need consistency. And so that's why I'm saying choose what's easiest for you and what you know you can maintain. So if you want them to start using the word um, go, um, that's a good one. That's what kids like to ask, go. And it has a sign, go. Um, I'll leave for Christy as well. There's a lot of um, YouTube videos where they talk about go, they use the sign and then they use the picture. We have these books that we use and these are also available. I can make these available to you. I purchased them, but we can make them available to you. So it like targets the word and if it's the word in, it just shows it. It's like a story just to reinforce. And you say put in, lunchbox in. And it's just, you notice every page is the same in because that's what we're reinforcing. So we have books like that, like different ways. There's you, there are YouTube channels that have, if you put in core word, core word AAC or protocol core word, they have songs about each um, core word. And because kids like music, then what I usually do to start the session is I start with the song and they listen to the song about go. And as the song is singing, then I'll do the sign or touch the picture. Um, and then after they've done that, then we play a little game where the car goes and I reinforce go again. And then for that evening, I'll send home to parents just one picture, um, just go by itself. Um, and if you don't have a picture, that's no excuse to don't worry. If you don't have a printer, just draw, write it, whatever it is, it's a visual. So I might say to the parent, just have the sign or the um, picture for go, put it on the front door. Your child likes to go outside to swim in the pool, put it on the patio door. So every time they have to go outside, you just tap, let's go swim, let's go. And you're just tapping and modeling. And then eventually you stop, don't model and wait and see if they'll just touch go and say, oh, you wanna go, let's go outside. And if it is that they like to go somewhere special, but I usually put it on doors, that's a good way for parents to start. So even every time you're leaving with the kid to get in the car, just go, let's go, and you can move on. 
It's not like I'm giving you a whole speech lesson to sit, sit and take toys out and start. Just put the words and the visuals in the spot where you need them. That's the easiest thing I can say for home. Um, on the fridge, you can put just a want, a symbol for want. Um, put a symbol for more right by the cupboard. The children always know where the snack cupboards are. On the snack cupboard, you can put a want. You can make it into a strip if you want and put the I want. This one is an I go. Um, but you could put I, the I want strip, put it on the cupboard where the favorite snacks are. Put it on the fridge if you know they like going for drinks. Um, doors for go. Anything, any place in the house where they're going to go because we want to create opportunities and we don't want to be searching for the pictures and the communication device. You want to have it right there because then the time you take to search, you're missing the opportunity to reinforce. So I think that's a basic way to start. Um, going with the symbols. I'm still interested in the person that said that um, child wasn't interested in pecs. Um, and they're not interested in visuals. Um, I'm happy to give you some more ideas just to set, but think of that pyramid and go back a few steps and work on those foundation skills and maybe work on objects and help with that object word association. And then from there, we can always do, you can always, I said we, I'm not working with you, but you can always do like object and picture. And then that's how you would usually try and develop that skill. But the takeaway is just do what fits at home for you in your routine. Just think to yourself, how many opportunities can I create? So if I'm going to do the word eat, I eat breakfast, snack, lunch, dinner, then that's four times for the day I can reinforce the word eat, the sign for eat, whatever it is. Um, and then choose what suits your child, what suits your child's needs. Um, so don't worry too much about the age of your child. Um, just think about the level that they're at and what they need. Because sometimes we spend time and effort giving kids, providing something that's not what they need or not at the level. Um, and I had that same experience with my godson where we were working, working, working to try and get him to do some other skill. And his obsession was just to stand outside and watch his sister ride her bike. Um, at the time, she's younger. And then we just thought, okay, let's just get him a bike because he's clearly obsessed about the bike. And so the skill shifted from working on his speech skills to then going to work on him just learning to ride a bike because that was what was motivating for him. And he was just so excited and he we just shifted to work on motor skills and motor development at that time because that's what was needed. And then from that, he could learn the word bike, um, and I mean, the way he speaks, most of his sounds are vowels, so they sound the same. So it would be ba, and when it was bike, as opposed to anything else. But the point is, he then developed another skill, you know, while his mom was waiting on more speech. But at least the thing is about shifting and meeting the child at their need, because then that opportunity created for him with the bike and learning the word wheel and push and turn and go. We need so many other language. Um, vocabulary that he learned. So somebody else is asking, how important is praise for reinforcement? Oh, wow. <laughs> that is like major. I think we do have to give praise. I think even us, it's not just an ASD thing. I think, you know, encouragement sweetens labor, right? So it's like, if we are praised and acknowledged for something we do better, it's just a human skill. It's not an ASD thing. But even so much more for our kids, if we're trying to maintain motivation, then giving that praise, it reinforces the activity we're doing. Now, the praise might look different. That's the thing. So the praise depends on, goes back to the interest of the child. So some of our kids are not interested in stickers. So giving, praise, giving a sticker as a praise or to reinforce that doesn't work. Maybe it might be that some kids you start out with little pieces of, again, food because that's a high motivator for most kids. You try not to stay there long with the food. You need to wean that quickly. Um, but praise is very important to help to reinforce skills. And I think when you say praise, I don't know if you mean all verbal praise, but even excitement. Yes, you did it or given more of what they um, like. So praise can look differently. It can be verbal. It can be a whole gesture. It can be giving them tickles if they like tickles. It might be giving them something tangible, like a favorite toy. So I, um, one of my kids I'm working with, he likes um, 
this one little toy and every time he does it then that's what he gets and if we're doing and then i moved away from giving him the toy because then he would hold it and fidget with it and distract from the session so what we started doing again is making pictures of the toy um so the toy was copied on a picture it's a robot thing and then over time on his um, reward sheet he could have how many pictures how many pictures of the toy and he knew after 10 he could actually get time to go and play with the toy so um, praise is very important um, in reinforcing skills and just helping with that motivation. And then the other thing you want to do with reinforcing and praise is that you want to stretch how much you give it. So you can increase uh, maybe for just learning, then after you do every one thing, you get the praise and reinforcement. And then if you're really good at that, then you stretch that. So I might delay the praise. So after now you can do three before you get praise or you get your preferred item. And then I might push that to five and then six and then 10. And then eventually the hope is that you will get so good at it or get or develop a new interest in whatever activity that I can delay the praise that long enough. Or you don't eat. a lot of my kids do they, you know, they come to sessions with their nice reward um, chart and their boards and they actually enjoy the activity we're doing. So I go back to the class and I'm like, to the teacher, we didn't even use it today. You know, um, but yes, praise is very important. That's a good question. I'll say just in terms of my friend with my godson, what um, I found it's hard for parents to decide sometimes what to put energy, time and money into. Um, and like the example with the bike, um, she and I had to do a lot of conversations and decision around what what she would what was worth her investing in that at the time. And I think as parents of children with autism or special needs, you almost have to make that call each time because you do, unless you have never ending resources, which most of us don't, it's almost making that decision about what's needed right now. What do I invest some time in? What do I put my energy in? Because if you have other kids as well, or you work, you have other things to do. So your time has to shift from um, between other things. And then what you need to focus on is, okay, how am I going to decide if I'm going to focus on his communication, his gross motor? Oh, should I make him learn to, should we work some more about getting dressed? Should we target this? Should I do feeding skills? Should I work more about him stretching his language? Um, and the thing to always go back and think about is what does he need right now in terms of if you find you're going to school every morning, you have to get out of the house every morning and it's taking him forever to dress and you have to dress him. And it's probably worth spending some time on dressing skills. You know, it's going to be whatever is going to be functional and that can help with some independence throughout the day. Think about that. Think about what's motivating for the child and then also think about what you can maintain at that time. And I think it's perfectly okay to, you know, focus on um, going to therapies for a while. And if you need to shift your money around anything and, and you need to pull back, that's fine too. And you work, but always have something working with at home. Um, and I think that's where having the thing like the visuals in place when you need them at home or signing or having those opportunities to engage. And then you can shift again. I think it's about having that flexibility and knowing it's okay to change what you what you put efforts into at different times in your child's life. Um, and don't feel guilty about making a, a, a um, decision to change what you invest in. And if you made the decision to change and you realize it didn't really give you as much benefit in terms of the child isn't getting ahead in terms of development or being more independent and you need to go back to something else, that's okay too. It's very much okay to go back, do something else or change. Um, I just wanted to mention that because a lot of parents, when they speak to me, they have a lot of guilt about not being able to do everything at once or not being able to pay for everything. Um, and then having to stop something, that's a big thing for them if, if money is a factor. So I think it's okay to just know that you can go back to things and you have to change depending on just your life circumstances sometimes. But then it's always worthwhile to keep reinforcing things at home with the routines and giving opportunities to communicate. Sorry, I just realized the time, Christy. I didn't say any more questions.
Okay, if there, if there are no more questions about communication, we could just wrap up. What do you think, Christy? And then um, we can always talk some more or I can give, when you ask your questions after, I can give answers. I have some, a handout with the strategies written down because I knew I talked a lot, but um, I have them written down so I can share with Christy. So just to go over, um, always try to create an opportunity for communication. The best way to do that is to pop it into a routine. Don't judge your routine. As long as it happens all the time, as long as there's consistency, then use a strategy there. Start with the routine, reinforce. It gives predictable language, more opportunities to communicate. Um, and that's a good place to start in terms of home. Put any visuals you want in the place where it's needed. That's a good takeaway. Um, and then reduce your questions and start modeling more commenting more on, on language. All right, so we're gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Thanks again so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And I think this is really exciting. I'm really interested in all the talks you guys are doing. And this is a great idea. So thank you, Christy. Thank you, Autism in Belize. And we'll be in touch. Okay. Bye.